That brings me on to introducing our amazing speaker for tonight. I'm absolutely delighted that he has agreed to come along to this event. Um, so this is Professor Pete Smith. He holds a personal chair in the Soils and Global Change at the University of Aberdeen. So his main areas of expertise are in modeling greenhouse gases, carbon mitigation, bioenergy, biological carbon sequestration, global food system modeling and greenhouse gas removal technology. In addition to being interested in all of this, he is also science director of Scotland's Climate Change Centre of Expertise. And I'm delighted to have him here for a chat um, on the current climate science, what can we, can we do to mitigate this? And also what are the kind of things, um, resources that are out there in order to communicate climate change? So thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass you on now to Professor Pete Smith for our talk today. Thanks very much, Izzy. I'll just share the screen. So hopefully you can now see that full screen. Great, good. Right, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the climate emergency, uh, what we need to do about it and where to find resources. Uh, so first off, uh, climate change is uh, in the news, uh, despite the fact that we've been talking almost entirely about COVID for the last uh, 12 to 14 months. Um, climate change remains in the news. Um, and this is just a few um, uh, few headlines that have appeared in the in the newspapers um, from last year. Um, so it's really at the, at the, at the top of the agenda. And 81% um, uh, of people now say that they uh, consider climate change to be one of the key things that, um, that they're interested in, uh, that they care about. So it's changed um, significantly in the last 10 years. I remember 10 years ago, I was still trying to convince people that climate change was happening and we still had lots of climate change deniers, but climate change denial now is largely an, an irrelevance because people, have, um, people are already accepting the reality of climate change and are already taking steps to address it. So briefly, um, what, what are the climate change effects around the world? Well, this is a, a, a little bit old now. This is from 2014, but this shows some of the um, impacts of climate change that, is, that, that we're already seeing and that um, are projected to get worse in the future. So we've got um, uh, floods and sea level, sea level rise, for example. Um, we saw some big floods uh, last year in particular, especially in the spring um, in the UK. Um, wildfires, um, you'll, you'll remember the Austra dreadful Australian wildfires at the beginning of last year and the Californian wildfires as well, um, which, which just happened. So these, this, these are projections made in 2014 about where these things may happen. Uh, and you can see it's actually fairly, uh, fairly accurate with Australia and California being the areas that are shown for wildfire, droughts in other areas, uh, crop changes, for example, yield loss and uh, droughts and extreme events affecting uh, crops and uh, 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 fisheries, um, mounting ice, of course, in the polar regions and water shortages where we're seeing intense droughts. And that's just a selection of images showing some of the impacts of climate change that we're already experiencing. So we used to talk about climate change as something that was going to happen in the future, but we're increasingly talking, talking about it as something that we're already experiencing. To a lesser extent, perhaps in Scotland, um, apart from floods maybe, and some extreme weather events, um, but uh, all over the world, and in particular um, in the developing countries where we're seeing uh, some, some enormous effects of climate change already. So according to NASA, um, we will see in the coming years uh, more frequent and stronger heat waves, storms, floods and droughts and famines um, than we're already seeing. Um, we're projected to get up to one metre uh, sea level rise by 2100, and it could be even higher. Uh, more pests and diseases and an ice-free Arctic in the summer before the mid-century. Um, just shown over on the right of this slide is a sort of a 
um, it was called the burning embers diagram, but it just showing basically the thermometer over here, showing what happens if we get one, two, three, four, five degrees of warming and the risks that occur um, in various things. So risks to unique and threatened species occur at very low temperatures. So we're already at around about 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial level. So we're already into the red here. Um, some of the risks, risk associated with extreme events, disruption of impacts, uh, global aggregate impacts, and risk of large scale singular events. That's things like the, uh, uh, the Gulf Stream switching off, for example, which would have a big impact, um, but um, is, is, uh, a, is a lower probability uh, at low temperature increases. So um, this is a world that we don't want to go to. This is a world that we don't want to be in. And we, we've not had a chance to um, uh, adapt to anything of this size and scale um, in all of human history. So it's, it's something that we really have to avoid. Um, the temperature increase can be seen just by plotting graphs, actually. This is just the, um, the uh, uh, global temperature anom anomaly. So that's just saying, comparing it to the long-term average. So this is the long-term average from 1850 to 1900. And this is comparing the global mean temperature um, uh, to that long term average. And you can see that it goes up and down in years, um, but you can see an inexorable increase in temperature. Um, this is another way of showing it. This is just a, um, a little, uh, a little um, animation um, from NASA. You can download this from NASA. Um, this is uh, um, looking at the temperature anomaly. Now, when I play this animation, the, the, the blue shows um, uh, temperatures below the long term average and the long term average here is between 1950 and 1980. And the reds show that um, we've got uh, an increase in temperature. So as, as we see warmer colors, that indicates a warmer temperature. So watch what happens as we move forward from 1880 in five year time, sp time steps uh, through to the present. So you can see there that um, some areas are getting cooler, some areas are getting warmer. There doesn't see a, seem to be a general trend. So we're now at about 1900 to 1905. Now we're at 1910, so we're going through. We just passed the First World War, but there's no real trend to see there. Some areas in the north are getting colder, warmer, but these are phasing in and out. So you're just getting some uh, fluctuations. Round about um, the Second World War, we see some warming. Uh, above the long term average, but by the 1950s that's gone. What I'd like you to look at, though, is what happens from the 1960s onwards, the late 1960s and 70s, where we start to see a big change in the colours on the on the on the global map. So now you're seeing that the uh, warmer colours are outstripping the cold colours. And as we go forward into the 1990s, 97 through to the year 2000, uh, through to the year 2010 and uh, going all the way up to 2018 and it ends in 2018. Uh, the map actually, the, the map actually in on the NASA site now goes up to 2020. So I'd advise you to have a, have a look at that. But what this shows nicely is that um, we had a period of um, with no observable temperature change. Um, but if you look at this map that we end up on and in fact all of the time since that from the 1970s onwards, we're seeing an increasingly warming world and some areas, particularly in the north, um, are, are seeing a, a temperature uh, temperature rise above the long term average of three or more degrees Celsius. So that's a really, uh, a really Im important uh, statistic. Another way of showing the uh, another way of showing uh, warming is to just plot out the temperatures. So. The blue temperatures again are the cold temperatures and the uh, red temperatures, the warm temperatures. And this is just plotting out uh, the uh, each year as a separate line, plotting out the temperature against the long term average. And it doesn't take a genius to work out that it's more red on the right hand side, showing that warming is increasing towards the present. And uh, we're seeing some of the uh, more extreme temperatures um, in the last few years and certainly in the last couple of decades. So this is another nice visual way to show how the climate has changed, that it's not just some mere fluctuation. 
But it's not only that we have this long term observational record, we've also got a, a mechanistic understanding of why this happened, why this is happening. Climate change is largely driven by uh, increases in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, and we can measure those. Uh, this is a very famous graph, it's called the Keeling curve, and it shows the measured concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this was first uh, undertaken at a Mauna Loa laboratory in Hawaii, um, which is high up and is in, in Hawaii in the middle of Pacific, so you don't get too much contamination from uh, local sources. And what you can see here with this sawtooth that you can see um, uh, in, in pink is the earth breathing. Because there's a bigger landmass in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, what we're seeing here is the greening up in the spring and the summer of the landmass uh, in the north. So that's CO2 being drawn down into the vegetation and soils. And in winter, that's released. And what we can see here is the long term average, uh, averaging out, smoothing that and you can see an inexorable increase. And we're now above uh, 400 parts per million. I remember when I started giving these lectures in, uh, in the uh, 1990s and the early 2000s, and we were well below um, uh, uh, 400 parts per million then, but now we're consistently above 400 parts per million, and that's marching upwards. So these uh, this increase in climate uh, in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in, in this case CO2, is driving the climate change. Uh, the, the greenhouse gases trap uh, the, 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 the heat in the atmosphere, which causes the temperature to increase. And that's what we see and that's what we have a good understanding of from a biophysical perspective. But it's not only CO2, um, two other important greenhouse gases our uh, climate, uh, our methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, this is uh, carbon dioxide, that's what I've just shown you. And if you think that this has only happened over the last 100 years, this is the plot over the last 10,000 years of CO2. And we can get retrieve this from uh, ice trap, uh, CO2 trapped in bubbles in ice cores uh, in the Antarctic and the Arctic. So we can track this back uh, many thousands of years. And it was uh, relatively stable uh, below um, uh, uh, 290, 280 parts per million. But then with the Industrial Revolution, you see this, um, uh, this hockey stick curve where we've got a massive increase in CO2 concentration. And if we blow that up and just, just have a look at that since the Industrial Revolution, you can see the carbon dioxide concentration increasing. Um, it's the same sort of figure we get for, for me uh, methane, shown here, that's a greenhouse gas that's about um, 25 times to 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. We see the same sort of, we see the same sort of trend, uh, consistent for about 10,000 years, and then the Industrial Revolution comes and we whack, whack those way up uh, beyond what's previously been seen. And nitrous oxide, a little more um, variation with nitrous oxide, but again, the same trend, staying stable for about 10,000 years and then going way up. So we've got to try to limit the temperature warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, we agreed this in the Paris, Paris Climate Agreement in 2014. That's when all the, all the governments of the world got together and signed the Paris Agreement um, which said that we should limit warming to two degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels with an effort to try and keep it um, within 1.5 degrees. So all of the global countries have signed up. As you know, America under Trump pulled out of that agreement, but under Biden, uh, America is now back in. So there's over 190 countries in the world have signed up to this commitment to try and keep temperature below 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius above the pre-industrial times. But unfortunately, global temperatures since pre-industrial times have already warmed by 1.1 degrees Celsius. So we've only got a point, about 0.4 degrees Celsius left to play with. And at current rates of emissions, this is pre-COVID, but at current rates of emissions, we were projected to exceed that 1.5 limit within five to 12 years. So these are Met Office and IPCC estimates. Those were made a couple of years ago, so we've already started eating into that time. Globally, we emit about um, 1,300 tonnes of carbon dioxide every second 
and greenhouse gas emission reduction needs to be immediate and extremely aggressive. So we're only going to hit this 1.5 target if we take immediate and aggressive action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And indeed, the UK, Scotland and many other countries have declared a climate emergency. So this is a declaration, at least, that we want to move in the right direction, that this is not, not something that we have ages to worry about, and maybe we'll get round to it in 2030 or 2040. We need to take rapid and aggressive action now, and that's the nature of the climate emergency. We can deal with this by, um, uh, firstly, uh, conventional abatement technologies. These are things like uh, replacing fossil fuel fuels with renewables, shown as this green band, uh, we've still got some emitting technologies in the mix. Aviation is going to be difficult to decarbonize, so we may need some negative emissions. That's things like planting trees and restoring peatlands to suck up carbon to get rid of the remaining emissions that we still have in the mix by 2100. But what are we going to do about it in the UK and Scotland? Well, firstly, let's look at where em emissions in Scotland come from. These are slightly old numbers. Um, but the figures are around about the same. Um, we have uh, uh, emissions from ag uh, electricity, um, industrial processes, business, agriculture are all shown on this slide. Uh, agriculture accounting for about 20% of emissions and forestry at the moment minus 19. So we're currently providing a sink for carbon. So that's removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But we clearly need to take we clearly need to make efforts in all of these sectors of the economy in transport 21 percent for example um, we need to um, we can't decarbonize just energy or just industry uh, we have to make uh, uh, changes on in all sectors of the economy so we have a climate change act in the uk we have a climate change act in scotland and these were recently updated with um, new climate change acts. So our new climate change commitments are for the UK to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And Scotland, which, as I said, has declared the climate emergency and its target is to reach net, reach net zero emissions by 2045. So that's to cut all emissions and any remaining emissions to be absorbed by um, negative emissions such as uh, biforestry or peatlands. So these are really, really stringent and difficult targets to me. So the question that I'm frequently asked when giving talks about this is this is this all seems to be something that the government needs to do. But what can we do as individuals? Well, a few examples are given here. So firstly, uh, work from home if you can. Um, some estimates that were done um, in the first lockdown suggested that working from home could increase by uh, 550 percent after the UK lifts lockdown and we've seen some indications from a number of com companies that for office-based jobs working from home is going to become uh, more, more prevalent and something that we can all do at least some of the time. Uh, using active transport or taping, taking public transport whenever you can or car sharing would have a, a, a big impact on reducing emissions. Uh, flying less or flying not at all is the way to go. We've all learned to do things on Zoom and Teams. I used to fly a huge amount around the world uh, before the lockdown uh, in, the, in the name of climate change, ironically. I'm going to be doing far less of that in the future because we have other ways to work now and we can do far more things remotely. Uh, eat less meat and dairy. Um, meat and dairy, um, the, your diet contributes uh, a significant proportion to your personal carbon footprint. So cutting, cutting, cutting out meat or at least eating less and eating less dairy would reduce your emissions. Uh, consumerism drives climate change because of the embedded emissions in what we buy. So don't buy stuff we don't need. Use less energy, um, insulate your homes, uh, move, to, remove to, uh, move to renewable energy to heat homes where you can. That's capital costs allowing. So when your boiler blows up and you need to replace it, consider, for example, getting a heat pump. Uh, you can always purchase low greenhouse gas alternatives and we can create some carbon sinks, such as planting trees. 
So there's a lot that we can do as individuals as well, as well as a lot that has to be done at the level of our governments and our local authorities. But we as individuals can make a dis difference and we can make a change. So um, lastly, just um, some useful resources. So um, the BBC science pages are great, I think. Uh, they're useful resources to show that climate change is happening. So this one on BBC News Science and Environment page, uh, which is what is climate change, a really simple guide. And another one on National Ge Geographic um, gives the, just the basics of um, uh, global warming um, and just provide a very basic scientific understanding. Um, to explain, to help you to explain to people what climate change is and how, it, how it's happening and what we can do about it. In terms of what we can do about climate change, there's an article on the BBC about called 10 Simple Ways to Act on Climate Change, which is a really useful resource. And there are some other ones, um, for example, the David Suzuki Foundation and others are around uh, 10 things that you can do to do about climate change. And again, these are the things that you can do as an individual person. And lastly, um, Scotland's Climate Change Assembly contains uh, some excellent videos. So all of the evidence that was provided to the members of the Scotland's Climate Change Assembly, which is just putting together its final recommendations at the moment, is available on the Scottish Climate Change Assembly's YouTube channel. All of the experts that gave evidence uh, put their videos up there and these are all short videos ranging from about two minutes to seven or eight minutes and these contain um, excellent uh, uh, videos on for example diet, land use change, travel, jobs, uh, transport and, and all sorts of the all sorts of other evidence that was considered um, in by the Scotland's Climate Change Assembly. And the last thing you can do is to have a conversation, a climate conversation within your own community. So these climate conversations um, can be funded. There's a small amount of funding that's available um, under, uh, from the Scottish government and you can apply for this online. And there are information packs that are made available to allow you to have um, discussions in your own community uh, for people that are interested in changing things. I'd just like to finish by showing a very short video, a two minute video, um, that we've made within our community um, just to um, put, for, put together some of the facts about climate change. So I'll just stop sharing this now and I'll share the video with you.